I don't know whether it's your practice to pray for the preacher. Uh, it's a good practice. But I want to focus your prayer today. Uh, we got back from Florida last night. Stephen's plane probably passed ours as he went to Florida. So you can pray for the preacher that he won't be bitter. <laughs> that my week is over and Stephen's is just beginning. But you probably should pray for Stephen that he has a restful and holy time. Well, I feel it's been a long time since I had teenage children in the home. But I do still remember the way in which they seem to go back and forth between needing parents' help and almost at the same time demanding their freedom from us. It took a lot of parental wisdom to get the response right. I don't suppose I always did. And to be fair, I'm sure it was very difficult for them as they grew into individuals as well. But I still remember it as very difficult. Of course, this isn't just true for young people, is it? We can all use relationships or perhaps abuse them by treating them conveniently as we think we need them. So that's the lens that I brought to this exchange between Peter and Jesus. It was at the back of my mind as I considered it. I actually think that there are important understandings in this encounter that can help us in our own Christian lives in a general way. Certainly the encounter between Jesus and Peter uh, has its own contextual meaning, but it also describes some pretty important understandings that you and I must pay attention to if we're really going to celebrate God's reign in our lives. You'll remember that Jesus and his disciples were still in the countryside near Galilee. Caesarea Philippi was immediately north of the lake itself. And Jesus had been doing wondrous signs in the midst of the people. In fact, Peter himself had just at this point in the gospel made his famous declaration that Jesus was the true long-awaited Messiah. It was just off his lips. And so as we come to the reading in Mark 8, we see that Jesus is teaching his disciples about his approaching death and ultimate resurrection. And it's at this very moment that the exchange, a famous exchange really between Peter and Jesus takes place. You have to try and put yourself in Peter's shoes, I think, at this point, because Peter can't imagine what Jesus is talking about. It doesn't fit with his unfolding idea himself of how the Messiah was to reign. And so, with all of the intimacy that their friendship had earned, he takes Jesus aside and rebukes him for talking like that. One can just imagine him putting his arm around Bob's shoulder and say, you can't talk that way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, don't be crazy saying things like that. That's not how it's going to go at all. The Messiah is going to take over the holy land of Israel and get rid of those hated Roman masters. You can't do that if you're dead. And what would happen to us anyway? Don't you care? The strength of Jesus' response at this moment takes Peter's and our breath away, I think. Get out of my way. You're acting like Satan, tempting me from what must take place. Your focus on the things of the earth doesn't allow you to understand the divine mission I'm on. The stakes are bigger than you have any idea about. Well, it does take our breath away, and it took my breath away as I read it again. It's a very powerful moment. And I began to try and figure out what it meant and what it means to us as Christians. Educational theory of transformational learning 
change, if you like, uh, acknowledges that learning involves two different realities. Holding on, which they t call embeddedness, and letting go. Pretty straightforward. Differentiation. Holding on and letting go. Both realities are part of change. There's always an embedded root to personally held positions, reinforced by values and experiences, and a hesitation, perhaps, to consider change or renewal or branching out, even if it makes sense to us at some level. This is how young people get confused, and parents too, by the vacillation between freedom and dependence. They want to be their own people, but they still cling to the inner child. It's the same thing for us in times of critical change in our lives. And dare I say, in the church. Maybe you've experienced it there. You're nodding, thank you. <laughs> I actually think that this holding on and letting go dynamic is at the heart of this exchange between Jesus and Peter. And it actually operates in both individuals. I believe that Jesus' love of his community of followers by now is growing at this point in his ministry. He loves the land as well, and of course his people. His own kingdom ministry of announcement and the signs he's doing of God's love are close to his heart. He's in some way becoming rooted in his own landscape in this part of the life journey. And yet, he acknowledges the calling he must follow at all costs, a calling on which the salvation of future generations will depend, on which our salvation depends. It's a calling on which the ministry of the church is to depend. If, if Jesus doesn't go to Jerusalem, if he doesn't enter into Easter, there will be no full revolu rev revelation of the full reign of God he's announcing. It all, it all depends on Easter. Without Jerusalem and Holy Week, it won't happen. I think that's why the energy with Peter, of, of the exchange with Peter is so powerful. And it's why Jesus knows that Satan is involved in Peter's rebuke. I'd like to think, I'm sure, that Jesus would have loved to follow Peter's instincts and to revel in his own developing influence in Galilee and an eventual overthrow of the Romans. Continuing to good, do good works will surely be part of his personality and character. But this is to be a transformational moment in Jesus' life, one in which he refuses to be limited by his circumstances or his embeddedness, if you want to follow that theory. It's a moment in which Jesus has to stand alone in God's future for him, differentiated from his community, from the advice of those around him, and from his own friend's subtle and powerful concern for him. Get behind me, Satan. Peter, you don't understand. When we understand Jesus' struggle in this moment, we can also appreciate, I think, Peter's agony as well. The idea of the way things are unfolding so far is very pleasing to Peter. He's like, well, I think he's like a political campaign manager who sees power as a real option for his candidate. We have some political connections in our immediate family, connections to politicians and campaign managers and the like. And we're told that most campaign managers get anxious when their charges lift their eyes from their prearranged script and speak from the heart. That's when they get into trouble. Peter rebuked Jesus for speaking about Jerusalem and clearly not from the right script. He did not understand the campaign that Jesus was running, a strategy that went through suffering and death. 
And so Peter tried to turn Jesus from his destiny, tried to get him to hang on to that present that was nicely unfolding and to deny the future that God had ordained. And in doing so, Peter found himself profoundly separated from Jesus in the moment of this exchange. Well, we're all like Peter in this, aren't we? We could even discourage the spiritual growth of close friends because it seems to separate them from us. After all, we just want to be comfortable and to keep the status quo. I think we must beware denying the spiritual growth of those around us because we may be threatened by it or fail to understand it. The church, you know, can sometimes limit growth in similar ways. In the church, we sometimes call it tradition and freeze it in time and space. Become embedded in it, stuck in it, mired in it, and often refuse to budge if indeed we could if we wanted. Well, who should decide what tradition is and what it isn't? It may make us feel warm and fuzzy, or it may stoke the fires of our romantic memories, but that does not make it part of the reign of God necessarily. So I think there's a caution here. It's the caution that Peter must bear. It's one that we must bear not to risk missing God's best future in order to protect our present. Maybe it's a word to St. Matthew's at this time in its history as it balances on what might be or might not be. So let's not, as a people, be on Peter's side. Let's be on Jesus' side, whether it means Jerusalem or not. Amen. Amen.